Take a long break, they're gonna say he bald me. Hello and welcome to the new Fly Fisher. I'm your host, Phil Rowley. On today's show, we're gonna take you through still water essentials. Everything you need to know about fly fishing still waters. We're gonna take you through rods, lines, reels, leaders, tippet, flies, the kit bag, everything you need to know and take with you when you go on the water. Stick around, it's gonna be a very informative show. Look at that fish. We talked earlier about having the optimum conditions. Here we've got perfect conditions. This is a good example of the family Heptogeneidae. This is why you need a lot of backing. On today's show, the new Fly Fisher crew is fishing in the parklands near Russell, Manitoba. The parklands is a stillwater fly fisher's dream. The area is known for its easy access lakes that hold large, aggressive trout. Most of these lakes are within an hour's drive of each other. I'm still fairly new to lake fly fishing, so when the opportunity arose to learn from experienced anglers such as Phil Rowley, I jumped at it. When we're fishing the long leader floating line technique or the naked technique, there's four variables the angler needs to balance. And that's sort of the challenge of this method that perhaps intimidates anglers. The first is leader length. Leaders need to be 25% longer uh, than the water is deep. We're using uh, 24 inches of butt section, nine to 12 feet of leader, and then adding tippet to complete the entire leader length. So for example, if I'm fishing 15 feet of water, I'm gonna need about 19 to 20 feet of leader to get down because the leader sinks in an arch like this. It doesn't sink straight off the end of the fly line. So we need to compensate for that with our leader construction. The next variable is pattern weight. We have to have patterns that can sink through the water column and get down to that feeding zone that trout most often prey upon food items. And that's one to two feet off the bottom in most instances. So we're gonna be taking advantage of split shotter for unweighted patterns, weighting patterns with lead substitutes or tungsten, or taking advantage of the many bead head options we have at our disposal today. Uh, the ver next variable after that is retrieve speed. Most of the food items in still waters do not move fast, so we need to use slow paced retrieves. If we get our retrieve going too fast with this method, we'll actually pull the fly up out of the zone we're, we're trying to, to cover. And the last variable is patience, and this is the hardest one for most anglers, is making that cast and letting the fly sink. Again, the naked technique, just when you think of still waters, don't just think it's a sinking line game. Your floating line that you brought from your rivers and streams or you first learned to cast with is an invaluable still water presentation tool. Whether you're fishing it naked like this with the long leader or whether you're using it in conjunction with an indicator. It's a great way to take trout in still waters and other species as well. I use this naked technique to catch walleye using woolly buggers and clousers. Deadly method to take trout and other species. When using a leech pattern, one way to give the fly more action in the water is to use a non-slip loop knot. Watch as Phil demonstrates how to tie the knot using a rope. What I'm gonna show you now is my favorite knot for tying the fly on whenever I'm fly fishing still waters, the non-slip loop knot. To begin, I'm just using a piece of rope here so you can see, I'm just gonna tie an overhand loop. About, when you're tying, it's about two to three inches above the end of your tippet. Take your fly, in this case my thermometer, slide the tag end through the eye of the fly, take the tag end of the leader through the overhand loop and draw both the loop and tag end to pull it close to the fly. There's the size of your loop right there. The loop size can also be adjusted when the lot is tightened and by pulling on the main line here. I'm gonna come up and grasp both my fly and the overhand loop, and just like a traditional clinch knot, I'm gonna go around four to six times, then back through my overhand loop, 
moisten with saliva, and the knot is drawn tight. And you can see when a fish strikes, once you trim this off, of course, when a fish strikes, the loop will not slam shut like a Duncan loop. Uh, stays open, and you can see the undulation. Any kind of fly we use, whether it be a coronamid, leech, damsel, minnow pattern, this fly has the ability to move throughout the water. It's a great knot, very, very strong. That little added action can be just a difference some days. Give it a try. Now I understand that the feel you're talking about, Phil. It was just a stop, and I see that you've managed to, to snag one yourself there. Yeah, it's pretty active in here. Okay, get it off my fin here. Get it up in the reel as quick as I can without forgetting I have a fish on. As Phil likes to point out, you gotta remember you got a fish on, so keep the tension on. And this is bulldogging, so I'm assuming it's a brown. It might be a rainbow, but I'm assuming it's a brown. Rainbows like to come up and jump. The browns, they bulldog like this. Well, and it's ash, so give me a good fight. Oh, it's taking some line. All right. Now, I don't want to put too much pressure on them as I only have a light tippet. And they're very, very strong fish. Well, now I'm, I'm getting a, a flash of them, and I think I do have a brown. Now, actually, I'll get Phil. Go ahead, Phil. Get him for me. Thank you very much, sir. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's OK. Put the anchor down for you here so we're not drifting away. I'll let you do the honors, sir. Yeah, took the coronamid. That's a beautiful little brown there. Yeah, I've got no complaints about that one. And another fine Parkland brown. Whoops, whoop. Not exactly a classic release but it's a fine mark of Parkland Brown. This area is incredible. Well, when you're still water fly fishing, like most uh, aspects of fly fishing, there's some unique tools and equipment that you wanna consider when you're on the water. Starting up front here, we have an aquarium net. Now they don't have to be this big, but you can go to any pet supply place and get aquarium nets of varying sizes. Perfect for dipping samples out of the water or along the shoreline, seeing what bugs are available. We have our throat pump and our clear white dish, or you can get a, um, a vial, a clear glass vial, and that's for examining food sources when you do a proper throat sample of a fish. We have a set of binoculars, ideal for observing other anglers, um, observing for signs of bird activity, which may be indications of a hatch or moving fish. We have a thermometer attached to a rope, so we can take the water temperature not only at the surface, but at depth as well. This is ideal in the summer months when trout will tend to seek the cooler waters um, for the comfort. A good pair of polarized sunglasses, not only for safety from errant flies, but you can see into the water where you can see um, perhaps cruising fish or emerging insects or bait fish, those kind of things. A good su supply of uh, tippet. We've got fluorocarbon tippet here and traditional monofilament. We have leaders, uh, probably my personal preferences are nine to 15 foot in length uh, with uh, breaking strains of anywhere to four to six pounds. I can always downsize um, the tippet from there if I make longer leaders. We have a good selection of split shot uh, for windy conditions to help keep our flies down, perhaps if we're using a floating line or a long leader, or if we're not using weighted flies, this can help get the flies down as well. A good selection of indicators, we have the corky style, yarn style indicators, and the bio strike biodegradable putty that we can use. A good wooden landing net. Um, these are perfect as well um, as they float, so you can bring a fish to net and uh, manage the fish carefully and not worry about the net sinking and focus all the time and energy on reviving that fish and letting it go away for another day. Um, long handle nets are, are nice in boats and pontoon boats as they simply extend the angler's reach. In a float tube, a smaller, a shorter length net uh, will work fine as well. And a good, soft, cotton, fish-friendly mesh. Um, we don't want to remove this, any scales or the protective slime from the fish, so look for those uh, fish-friendly nets when you're looking to get your net. And we have a, just a standard hand towel 
on cooler days with a bit of wind when you've released a few fish and that cold water gets on your hands and evaporates, it can really knock your, uh, your uh, enthusiasm down if you have cold hands. So just a quick drying towel uh, really helps things out. And then obviously a nice bag to put it in, uh, waterproof in nature to protect everything. Everything you need is in a small compact unit. These are just some of the things you want to consider when you're going on the water, in addition to your rods and lines, those kind of things. Well, Bill, these old fish cleaning stations can be a, a real source of information. We've got, first of all, spider webs, which um, will collect um, all the sort of small insects that have been emerging, uh, mayflies, small caddis, coronamids. Just down here, we've got uh, dragonfly husks. So these are the crawling nymphs, sprawling nymphs, rather. And if we look on actually down on the wood here, there's got to be half a dozen dragonfly nymphs I can see either just in the grass or actually crawling up. And there's a little damsel well, we right beside We've got a damselfly coming yeah. up, so we, we, we're getting a real treat here. We're getting yeah. everything. And the, and, thing, and the damselflies do the same as the exactly. dragonflies. They emerge the same way. Exactly. And if we're not observant as fly fishers, we, we will choose the wrong flies because we're not being observant. We're not using our eyes to see what Mother Nature, the clues. Mother Nature's leaving us clues every day, so we need to be observant. You know, uh, today I'd be thinking, maybe I want to go anchor in the shallows and cast out to deeper water and retrieve dragon or damselfly nymph patterns right. yeah. because fish are going to be seeing a lot of those. Yes. In many instances, these food sources stay hidden throughout their, their uh, as they mature as nymphs. And then when it's time to emerge, like most insects, they expose themselves and trout being the opportuni opportunists right. will pounce on all that now available food sources. And that's a big morsel. Another fish to the coronamid here. It's been a great evening, and this one I think is a brown because unlike the other ones, this is just bulldogging down deep. Rainbows come up on the surface and are really quite aerobatic in their, in their attempts to, to flee. I'm gonna do a nice backlash going here. So we'll just reel that back up. I don't wanna get that in trouble later on if the fish makes another run. Oh yeah, looks like a good brown. Very nice brown. Yeah, it's taking the bottom dropper. That must be the one where it's getting, I think it's a brown. I'm not sure, it's big. Oh yeah, it's a big brown. What a beautiful fish. Look at the spots on that. Not very long, but wide down the side and up the back. And again, that perfect hook set right in the beak. Right in top dead center, we call it. Look at that. That is a beautiful parkland brown. And there we go. What a magnificent fish. These are pretty special. You don't get these in every province or, or state. So these browns are a real treat to get on the fly in still waters. Whoa, gave me a little shower there. What I'm doing is trying to get the fly out of him. He's rolling around, so I want to get this fly out as fast as I can so he doesn't entangle himself or accidentally stab me in the process. And again, this is why you work on getting the flies out of the net because with two fly rigs or some provinces or jurisdictions, three fly rigs, um, you can get yourself into trouble. So this, I'll show you, is a, just a Absolutely stunning Stillwater Brown. Back up. Okay, well, for most of my Stillwater situations, I prefer rods between five and seven weight. Probably a five weight is my all around favorite. I just like the action of those rods. I like soft to moderate action rods. I like to fish floating lines and long leaders. Those softer action rods um, um, are a bit more sensitive to the strike, um, a little more forgiving. Uh, facilitate uh, casting more open loops with longer leaders and a bit more sensitive as far as feeling many of the subtle takes we face when still waters. When it comes to lines, there's many choices out there. Um, I would start with a floating line and then from there uh, an intermediate or the clear intermediates. Those three lines would probably suit you just fine and then you can add in more specialty lines like a fast sinking line um, such as a type four or five for fishing buoyant patterns for example along the bottom or into the deeper reaches, clear tip lines, a lot of things that way. But remember as fly fishers we're on still waters, we're 
suited best for fishing water 20 feet deep or less. That's where photosynthesis takes place, the weed growth. So that's where trout are gonna go in and forage and we have the best opportunity to match them with our tackle. We have all our presentation options available to us in both flies and fly line choices. He's still there. I thought he'd thrown it. Again, this is on the, the uh, naked technique, double coronamid, the black and black and red. Gave him, if one is good, two is better. And again, this take was very soft. It just felt like a, a, a slight weight on the line. A, a weedy sensation is probably the best thing I can describe. And I just instinctively raised the rod. Again, that low rod position, all I have to do is raise the rod to about 10, 11 o'clock. If the fish is there, he'll react, and, and this one did. And he's just doing the typical tiger bulldog here. And again, I'm just, you see how that soft to moderate action rod really absorbs those head shakes. Well, this is a big tiger. And there's that nice coronamid hook set right in the top part of the jaw. And that. There's a nice big tiger trout. And again, coronamids are such an important food source uh, for still water trout. Probably the number one food item over the course of the year on many productive still waters throughout the West and, and North America. But that is a gorgeous tiger. Phil, let's talk a little bit about flies. Now, I know there's three basic flies that you should have for still water, which are scuds, coronamids, and leeches. Could you tell us a little bit more about them, what we need to, to look for in these flies? Certainly, Bill. Um, the first one I've got here is a box of my coronamids, or one of my boxes. I have a bit of a coronamid addiction. But down the left-hand side, or my left of the box, I have a selection of coronamid larval patterns, or bloodworm, as they're commonly known. A uh, very good pattern to fish throughout the season, uh, long life cycle, and lots of species, so lots of opportunity for imitation. On this side here, and if I flip over, you'll see more here, quite a range of sizes and colors in coronamid pupa. And the pupa is the stage after the larva transforms and travels up to the surface. They use trapped air and gases to do this, so your patterns need to have a degree of shine to them to simulate that. Lots of different body colors, blacks, browns, shades of olives and mm. greens, lots of contrasting ribs, red wire, gold wire, copper wire, silver wire, lots of use of bead heads to help sink the pattern, uh, prominent white gills, whether they're yarn such as this, or white beads, which really work well in algae waters because they don't foul up with the algae. So that's a good basic coronamid selection. And again, it's a year round food source or an all season long yeah. food source. Now we got uh, scuds here. Tell me a little bit about them. Well, scuds are another staple there on, on these productive lakes here. Uh, for example, in Manitoba, they're just chocker block full of big gamorous and hyalella scuds. There's two families to consider, size being the only differentiator. Gamorous they being the They look the, the big, same, just one's bigger yeah, than the other. gamorous are the bigger ones. And again, simple patterns, dubbed bodies, um, shellbacks on them of raffia, uh, midge flex, um, pearl mylar, those kind of materials, bead heads on the front to help them get down a little bit in, in choppy water and, and give a little flash and sparkle. And uh, just a range of colors, predominantly greens, shades of olive green. Um, they match the bottom vegetation, so your fly mm -hmm. pattern selection should yeah. match those. So a good selection of scuds, probably from a number 10 down through 16 and a number 12 would be a good average scud pattern to work. Now uh, here's the leeches. Yeah, the next box here we have are the leech boxes, the, the big bushy ones, and I've also got some forage fish in here as well, which is another important food source in the Parkland region. But you can see an awful lot of marabou and rabbit used in here. That really w. moves in the water. Yeah, it? it just comes to life, and we need that because the leech has that undulating yes. motion, and we need to imitate that. And we use lots of different colors, blacks, clarets, browns, olives, um, darker colors. You got to consider leeches are active in, in uh, low light conditions, so patterns that push water give a good acoustic footprint will be good right. too. Trout can hone in on them with their lateral line. We've got a few minnow patterns up at the top here as well. We need to have those. In these lakes, we have fathead minnows, sticklebacks, so whatever lakes you're fishing, yeah. match, pick up. Uh, there's so many minnow patterns and bait fish patterns out nowadays, you just got to change its colors to yeah. match ones in your local waters. 
So that's a good starting point for the flies you want to carry. And then there's others, there's damselflies and dragonflies. And every lake, like every river and stream, right. has different hatch pot, sorry, different invertebrate populations. And some lakes have better caddis than others. And then we have damsel and dragon populations. So you're and always- that's through experimentation, you find out if that's happening. Yeah, you'll build up a collection of flies in pretty short yeah. order. <laughs> That was funny, I saw that working, that there was a, I seen a fish nervous jump. water. And I just as my, um, maybe it was the same fish, I don't know, it sounded after attacking those minnows. And I gotta watch here because I may have anchor issues. Oh no, he's out. So again, he's whacked the coronamid and on that take, I didn't. I saw the actual, the, the water is flat enough here and with my perspective in the boat, I actually saw the little tip of the fly line just start to move before I ever felt anything at the hand. So uh, not only is it a bit of a touch game, obviously, but if you can watch that fly line like a hawk, because basically this floating line, it's a big 90 foot strike indicator. So keep your eyes glued to the tip where it enters into the water and watch for any kind of movement, whether it pulls down or moves right or left. This is a rainbow, it's full of, these uh, parkland rainbows are certainly full of energy. And this one is no different and just a gradual raising of the rod tip to steer him into the net. You can see that coronamid right in the top dead center, right in the top of the jaw. There we go. So again, that's probably a, not the biggest rainbow we've caught today, but definitely a great fish to finish any day on. Beautiful parkland rainbow. I hope you've enjoyed today's show. I've hoped you've learned some tips that'll improve your still water fishing. For information on this and any other show in our series, please visit us on the World Wide Web at www.thenewflyfisher.com.